Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Pick, and I'd like to welcome you to the webinar titled Advances in Aortic Valve Surgery Using 3D Imaging and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, if I've yet to meet you, I'm the patient who started heartvalvesurgery.com all the way back in 2006, nearly, actually, it's over 15 years ago. And the mission of our website is really simple. We want to educate and empower patients and people just like you all about heart valve disease management and treatment. This webinar, which has had registrations from over 480 people in countries all over the world, was designed to support that mission. Now, during the webinar, you're going to be in what's called listen-only mode, but I'd encourage you to go ahead and submit your questions that are in the control panel on your screen. I'll explain why as we move over to the agenda. Today, I'm gonna to go ahead and introduce our featured speaker. We're gonna talk about aortic valve surgery. We're gonna have an opportunity to see the impact of 3D imaging and artificial intelligence on the future, and I would even say the current day of aortic valve surgery. And I believe this is gonna be a first time showing of some new technology that patients haven't seen before. And I believe many doctors haven't seen before either. So I'm really excited about this. We're gonna have a Q&A session, and then I'm gonna ask you to complete a very quick five question survey as we wrap up. Now, when it comes to the featured speaker of today, I'm honored and I'm humbled to introduce Dr. Mark Gerdish, who is the Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Franciscan Health in Indianapolis, Indiana. During his extraordinary 25 plus year career, Dr. Gerdish has performed over 6,000 cardiac procedures and more than 4,000, that's right, 4,000 have involved some form of heart valve repair or replacement. He is a researcher. He is an innovator. He is one of the leaders when it comes to the development of minimally invasive techniques for valve surgery. And he's designed a very um, special rapid recovery protocol. He's so committed to the treatment of heart valve disease. Yes, his license plate reads HRT V A. <laughs> L V heart valve. And that's not a joke. I've seen it. So with that being said, I could go on and on about the career of Dr. Gerdish and all the achievements that he's had in cardiac surgery. But what I really love about Dr. Gerdish is this. It's what patients say about him. And here you can see at heartvalvesurgery.com, he's, he's successfully treated over 120 patients. This is the other thing I love. It's not just about what they say, it's how they appear, right? And the smiling faces of his patients, whether it's Todd Runnenbaum, Tom Durlushen, Matt Shute, Timothy Kennedy, Linda Kincaid, Nana, Nina Bamford, John Pershinger, Pershinger, and in February, yep, Janelle Hurst. She had a successful mitral valve repair with Dr. Gerdish. And just two weeks ago, Dan Rodin, who's on the line today, had a successful aortic valve surgery with Dr. Gerdish. So with all of that being said, I'm sure he's maybe blushing a little bit because he's so humble. I'd like to introduce you all to Dr. Mark Gerdish. Hi, good afternoon and evening, everyone. Thanks for getting on with us. This is actually going to be pretty fun. It's stuff that is really fun for me, and I think you'll enjoy it. Um, I love all these pictures because I don't really ever get to see them. And uh, actually on that, that left side there, that's a mother-daughter pair that uh, had the same operation. And the gal, the, the mom, she came in with her best friend on the, on the same day and had their surgery together. <laughs> so it's really fun. All right. Am I in control of this thing yet? You should be. Am, okay. Gosh. All right. Let's see. Let's let it go then. Click. Great. So we're going to have kind of a, this will be an evolving conversation. I want to get to get kind of all the sexy and fun stuff pretty quickly, but I'm going to talk about a little bit of the landscape 
that goes into kind of the human side of figuring out when I say human, not only the psychosocial and emotional components, but the physiologic aspects of putting a device in a human being in that environment, in that milieu. So how do, how do we figure it out? How do the patient and I make the call? How do we decide when and what are we doing? Um, and you all know, you've all seen surgical valves, transcatheter valves. On the left there is a onyx valve. Some of you who know me would know that we did some really spectacular studies with that device and we have one ongoing right now where we are, instead of using warfarin or Coumadin, we're using Eliquis or Apixaban, uh, and we're well into that study, which is a randomized control study for the FDA, and that's exciting. And the next valve is kind of a standard tissue valve. It's a, probably the most implanted bioprosthetic valve on the planet, which is the Edwards uh, Magna. And it has a kin, which is a newer version that is kind of designed to take the next one, which is the TAVR. So can we put a TAVR inside of a tissue valve later? You've all heard about that. Uh, which is pretty cool and a little bit glamorous, but we have to think about it in terms of, uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, can't I just have a taver later? I said, you certainly can, but you won't, it's not like you're coming in for a haircut. You're coming in to have a major procedure again. So we want to forecast what that major procedure will be like. Can we make it an, you know, a seamless and not difficult experience for the patient? So with that, uh, you, we, people have heard me talk about this before. The clock's different in every human being. You cannot tell someone how long a tissue valve is going to last. In them. The environments are all different. Now, we can make some predictions, and here are the things that we can predict. The bigger the valve we put in, the longer it lasts because, you know, as the valve stiffens and the, valve, the hole gets smaller, it's a relative thing. So it's the size of the valve versus the size of the patient. And there are some other things we can talk about with respect to that environment and physiology that I'm going to get to in a minute that help people kind of put a valve in the context of their body and then think in terms of what their goals are in life. So this is a neat paper, um, although I do have a bone to pick with it. It's still kind of fun to read because it talks about what we just talked about. So what do you do? Do you do... Saver, taver, 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 saver, taver, 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 taver. How do you figure that out? You know, the risk benefit relationship, that seesaw. And I think this is the perfect diagram for it because it's a seesaw where you're balancing things. And those, those elements weigh differently for different human beings. And it's not, there's nothing robotic about it because you'll see that in the context of a person's physiology and their specific anatomy, which we're really going to get into, the behavior of the valve, the performance of the valve, the hemodynamics, everything is different. So, and then I put down at the bottom, what about just SAVR? Because mechanical valves can't be left out of the conversation, especially with the onyx valve where we're, we're switching to a non warfarin therapy. There are people who are going to have one procedure for their whole life. So it's worth thinking about. So it's not just that younger patients live longer, right? That you have know, this long time, the clock is ticking, the valves are going to wear out. It's also true that those bioprosthetic valves, if we don't intervene at the right time, and if we haven't made the right predictions, and if we don't have the right options, that that's going to create some morbidity and issues for patients over time. Now, this is a procedure that I love to do. Um, it, I think it's probably of all the things we had with valve and valve, this kind of changed, I felt, the trajectory of it. We can only, we're only supposed to do it for high-risk patients, uh, but we can take a transcatheter valve, put it inside the old valve, and then crack the old valve. Uh, but if we're going to do that, we better know the anatomy. We have to have room for it. It's not in an empty space like this is. It's inside your aorta, inside your heart. So we have to be able to make predictions about that. Uh, the other thing is we have to know where the aorta is. Uh, this is a, a minimally invasive aortic valve replacement uh, through a, you know, a, 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 an incision that's four or five centimeters long, which is great. But we got to know that when we go in through that spot, 
that that's exactly where the aorta is. And we have to know the dimensions of the aorta and we have to know where the coronary arteries are and we have to be certain about what we're doing. So we wanna match the long-term performance of the device and planned re-interventions with the longevity of personal vision of the patient. What does the patient want? What do they see in their future and what they wanna deal with? As I mentioned before, the milieu, the physiology of the human being affects the durability of the valve. And th these two slides are really almost placeholders to remind me to talk about it because they don't expect you to understand the, the uh, drawings, the, the, the uh, graphs. But what this delivers is information that tells us that folks who have uh, an increased level of inflammation in their body, uh, if they have what we call cardiometabolic syndrome, which is extremely common now in our current society, hallmarks are central adiposity, diabetes, hypertension, uh, those things will diminish the durability of a valve. They'll change how long it lasts. So we have to, we have, to have a honest view of it. We have to have perspective with respect to that and then offer the patient the options that will, that will impact them in the most positive way. So we always need to consider what is next if and when another valve is needed, right? Examples. I just talked about dysmetabolic syndrome. 64-year-old gentleman, type 2 diabetes, hypertension. He's 64 years old. Uh, this is a woman actually, yeah. Uh, only three and a half years into the valve. So this is early, right? But the patient also had a high bleeding risk. So I had to use another tissue valve. But this time I switched to a different type of tissue in hopes that we might get a little more mileage out of it. And I made sure I put a big valve in. But the point being that the clock is different for every human being. A 45-year-old gentleman who had a transcatheter valve put in, he had chronic renal failure, had a kind of a sick heart, and they put a transcatheter valve in him, but it didn't last very long. People with renal failure will really burn through a tissue valve quickly. So we took that out and put a mechanical valve in for it. Here's a really tough question, right? This is not, this is not something people want to see. Patients don't want to talk about not being on blood thinner if they're getting a tissue valve, but the reality of it is, this is Dr. Peabody is just brilliant. His whole lab is fabulous and telling us the truth about things. If we're doing our jobs, we just had a patient we were talking to earlier who's on blood thinner. If we're doing our jobs, we offer and treat people with blood thinner in the appropriate scenarios. So if a patient has a thromboembolic event, a stroke and thromboembolism, if their valve is deteriorating, if it's severely deteriorated, it's become stenotic, we should probably have them on anticoagulation. If we do a valve in valve, we haven't figured this out yet. Is everybody supposed to be anticoagulated or some supposed to be anticoagulated? We're going to talk about some of that a little bit later and you'll see why. So uh, it's not a free pass. Tissue valve doesn't, isn't a free pass. If we look at nationally, one third of people who have tissue valves are on blood thinner. Real anticoagulation like Eliquis, Pradex, or, or, uh, or uh, Warfarin. So remember, We've got a disease, we're trading it for a different one. So what are people afraid of? And what do they need to think about? Device selection, we talked about that. Operative method also, right? So we have to think about, is it minimally invasive? Do we need to do a root enlargement? Do we have to place a, replace the whole root? We have to treat the aorta. What are we doing at that moment in time to ensure the best long-term trajectory? And we have to think a little bit about the fact that some of those valves, when they're starting to get diseased, but they're not ready to be replaced done or redone yet, uh, they're still not performing fully. So you're going to have a valve that doesn't work perfectly. Reoperation, reintervention, stroke, death, the importance of timing of other issues, right? Coronary bypass, coronary interventions might be stents or treatment of atrial fibrillation, managing those disorders that come with, they come commonly with valve disease. Can we go back a quick slide? I've got one question. Yeah. Cause I think this sure. is a, I think this is a point that a lot of patients, I know me included, did, don't always understand this idea of trading diseases. So I've got aortic stenosis, I've got symptoms, I need a valve to help out. But you're, what you're alluding to here, and correct me obviously if I'm wrong, what you're saying is by getting that bioprosthetic valve, mechanical valve, now you have a different type of disease. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, I mean, we all have our physiologic burdens, right? We all have things about us that, that are changing, that pose some kind of threat. It's the nature of being a human being. And people with valve disease, it's the valve. So the valve gets, the native valve gets to a point that we know that 
if we don't do something, the patient's gonna live shorter. And we know from the data that replacing the valve makes them live longer. So we try to time it right, but that's their new disease. They had a bad disease, now they have a less bad disease. <laughs> now the tissue valve, is going to run its course, right? It's gonna change over time. So that's the progression of that disease to the next level. And you know, if you're 80 when you get the valve, it's probably gonna last you the rest of your life. If you're 65 and you know, got, and if you've got 20, 30 years in you, guess what? The valve is not gonna last forever. So that valve is gonna to get to the point where it's not working great. You gotta decide, is it time to go? Do I just deal with it for a while? But mechanical valve is not perfect either, right? So mechanical valve, you gotta be on the blood thinner, uh, there's risk related to that. There's maintenance of the blood thinner. Um, the nice thing about a mechanical valve is once they're working, they work the same forever, but they still, you know, there's still the hassle. That's your other disease, right? Your new disease, I got a mechanical valve and I have to be on blood thinner for it. So that's the point there. Got it. And I'm sorry to interrupt. I just had to ask that no, question. No, I appreciate it. I just don't if want to I... dwell too long because I don't know how long people want to stay on here. And it's going to, you know, yeah. I go too slowly. Um, so 50 year old guy. So this is just that, what we were just talking about. So he got his, he got his valve six years before. Yeah. So he's 44. And sometimes, you know, a tissue valve in a 44 year old will go a decade. Sometimes it'll go 12 years, but sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and so when his valve started to deteriorate, his heart started to pay the price. It started to get thick and wasn't working as well. And we call that the disease of moderate or moderate to severe aortic stenosis before the redo. So how do you decide to go sooner in an asymptomatic patient? Fit person, they're doing okay. How do you decide? We don't have the answer to that, by the way. So I'm not saying I can answer it. I'm just saying it exists. So it's important that people are, as the valve starts to show changes, that's when surveillance has to become tightened up a little bit and look for more subtle changes so that you can have a, the, kind of an ongoing conversation with the patient. So he was still young, so we gave him a, gave him an onyx valve. Click, there we go. Uh, another, this is a really interesting story. 72 year old woman, 20 months out from a sapien, a transcatheter valve. They had done it because she had had chest radiation and they were worried, were worried, worried about going in after her chest radiation. But you know, it, it didn't last very long. And there's two reasons for that. If you look at the picture up on the left, the first thing you see is that small valve, that's the smallest version of the valve that they make. So it's already a little bit of an eight ball but it's pinwheeled. See those leaflets aren't fully expanded. So when it went up, it didn't expand all the way. Now I, I'm going to show you some technology toward the end of this where that would have predicted that. The other thing is you'll see, as we look through the valve, the leaflets don't open super well. And once we have it out that, that right here, if you can see my pointer, that's a ring of what we call panis or tissue ingrowth that was underneath the valve. So this was a little hole that she was pumping her blood through. We cut it all out and put a big old Bioprosthetic valve in there for. So uh, this is an interesting story because more than the fact that it failed, just, you know, okay, it failed. More than the fact that it failed. She was 72 when she got a 20 millimeter Sapien 3. What was the next valve going to be? Even if she'd gotten eight years out of that valve. Now she's 80 and then she has to have surgery. So what's the, what's the next move for the patient? Um, this is a little diagram just to remind people what we're talking about. You can see over here on the left, uh, the left ventricle pumping, pushing the blood through the aortic valve, right? Blood comes from, comes from the lungs. I have a little model, a little plastic model that my patients will tell you that I show everybody. And I go, I actually show where the blood goes because people, sometimes they don't, they can't put it all together. Right? So blood coming back from the lungs, oxygenated blood goes through the mitral valve, left ventricle pumps, pushes it through the aortic valve into the aorta out to the body. And we see it over here uh, diagrammatically. These are some of the components that I was talking about with respect to nuance. So it's not a pipe with a valve in it. It is a, an organ almost. The aortic, the aortic root is its own organ. It has its own behavior. And it is responsible for making sure that the blood flow in this aortic root is of a nature that keeps the leaflets clean lets them close properly, and the blood has to go into the coronary arteries to feed the heart. As soon as we disrupt that route, as soon as we do something to it, we change the characteristics of that flow. And so we have to be, we have to be aware of it. And we have to pay attention to all of that. I'm gonna show you that. Transcatheter valves, 
uh, let's face it, an unbelievable asset. It's greatest thing that's happened to aortic stenosis in 20 years. Um, certainly has allowed us to treat people that were mm, challenging to treat in the past. So that's wonderful. And now we see also we can use it in folks that are lower risk and, and we have the opportunity to do valve and valve when a uh, bioprosthetic valve is failing. So we're going to talk a lot about that. A lot of different transcatheter valves out there. The ones that folks will see the most of are the core valve and Sapien. These are clearly the front runners. The Sapien is the most implanted bioprosthetic or transcatheter valve in the country. But we also have some valves like the Jenna valve, and there's another one called the J valve that we can use for aortic valvular insufficiency, so leaking aortic valves. Uh, the two basic types, though, of transcatheter valves are self-expanding. So that's the patient, that's this, the core valve. It opens up on its own once we release it. Or the uh, balloon expandable, which is the sapien. And we're going to look at kind of how those look in the aorta. So how do we understand the interaction between the device and the anatomy? How do we figure that out? And so uh, this is Dossi. Dossi is a company. It's also a man. You know, we talk, you, you mentioned artificial intelligence. We're not actually using artificial intelligence. We're using human intelligence and it's Dr. Dossi's. So uh, Dr. Dossi could probably do a much better job than I'm going to do talking about this, but he knows that my um, enthusiasm is unfettered. So uh, I hopefully I'll get the main, I'll get the messages across, but this has taken us to a different level of prediction. Our ability to model the aortic root to make predictions about what the future will be for this. Um, and I'll say before I get into this, this is the tip of the iceberg. You are seeing the beginning. Uh, we will make our way down into the ventricle. We will be able to model uh, aortic valve repair. We will figure everything out eventually with respect to flow. And, um, and, and as a matter of fact, I'm gonna harken back to Da Vinci in a few minutes and you're gonna think, wow, Dasi Da Vinci, that's how it works. So we've got, we've got examples of the interaction, the interplay. So this is the first time we've been able to really characterize, this is an actual aorta of somebody. So we've been able to characterize what will be the behavior of the aorta, the leaflets, the sinuses. Look at on the right side, look at the annulus expanding, the sinus geometry changing, the calcium in the leaflets moving, the leaflets moving toward then eventually uh, the coronary arteries and, and taking up space in the sinuses. So it's cool that we can just push, like you see on the left side, we can push the, the uh, leaflets out of the way. But now what have we done? We've pushed the leaflets out of the way. <laughs> so now they're in that space where they're not usually stuck. So we're going to look at the impact of that. Here's one of those impacts. This is the most, this is probably the most important um, element of this with respect to saving lives. So we're going to get into more kind of esoteric, sophisticated physiologic things. But when you think about putting this uh, cylinder up inside of a person's aortic valve, now the aortic valve leaflets are standing up straight because the, the cylinder is pushing up straight. And if it just so happens that the leaflets are long or the sinuses are short or the sinuses are small, those leaflets can get pushed back till they cover the coronaries. So this is an example of that. These coronaries, this left coronary artery is obstructed. This right coronary artery is obstructed. The blood can't get to the coronary artery. The patient will die. So this is extremely rare. And we are incredibly compulsive about ensuring that we've done every measurement possible. But there are some very kind of close calls. And this technology, which I'm showing you, can ameliorate that, can eliminate it really. So here's a valve in an aorta. This is actually a valve in an aorta. Uh, Dr. Dossi is kind enough to color code the leaflets so we don't get confused. And the, uh, we can see the coronary arteries coming off that big curly one with the branch on it at the left main coronary artery, the other is right main coronary artery. It's still attached to the heart there. And you can see the calcium, the calcium is the yellow. So those leaflets, uh, have that calcium occupying that space. The calcium is responsible for limiting the movement of the leaflets. And we also see this big boulder underneath the valve, right? That new valve is going to seat underneath there. If we're doing surgery, we cut that, all of that stuff out and put a new valve in. If we're doing a transcatheter valve, we push it out of the way. And that's fine. And it usually is not a big deal. You can see there's calcium down in the mitral valve too. Look at that. See that calcium, that worm there? That's mitral annular calcification. 
We have to deal with that too when we do mitral valve surgery. So on the left is that aorta, same aorta now with a bioprosthetic valve in place. You can see the leaflets have been taken out. There's a bit of calcium left that wasn't in the annulus. It's outside of it. So that valve just gets seated in there after cutting out the leaflets and leaves a clean space uh, in the sinuses. This is a mechanical valve. And by all mechanical valves are now by leaflet like this. And you can see that they have a very low profile. You know, of all the devices we implant, they occupy the least space in the aortic root. So they kind of allow for a little bit more natural flow in the aortic root. Uh, but this gives you an idea of what it looks like in the human aorta. It's the same aorta. Uh, this would be the positioning of a transcatheter valve. This would be the positioning of a different transcatheter valve. So first one is a sapien. This would, and I'm going to breeze through these because you're going to see the, the money shot here. So now this that is a sapien valve positioned across the aortic valve, a model of, in a, an actual aorta. That is the Edwards core valve positioned across the aortic valve in the same aorta. You see that big punk chunk of calcium there. So you can see those valves open up, right? And you see that you actually see this sapien valve pushing on that big chunk of calcium harder, right? So that's a signal, that's a warning. We might have trouble there. So the sapien valve, the Edward valve, they go up by different processes, right? The sapien valve, like I said, is the most common valve, the one most commonly implanted. And we put that up with a balloon. The Edward, the, uh, the core valve, which is the Medtronic device, which is the taller one, that one expands on its own. So that's the sapien, again, pushing on that calcium. That's the Medtronic. And it takes, it takes on a configuration that allows it to kind of wrap around that area where the calcification is. So here's the importance of that. This is a, basically a heat map. And that heat is that chunk of calcium going through the aorta. So this is an actual video from an actual patient. It's not my patient. I just know that this is a true actual patient the, uh, where the choice that was made, and it was a logical choice based on what the, the standard CT scans showed. So on a standard scan, you might look at this and say, oh yeah, Sapien's gonna work well. But if you have a dynamic image like this, that includes information on how solid calcium is, how soft or not soft the aorta is, calculations can be made from this technology and they keep making it better to determine the risk. This is an actual patient. That chunk of calcium went through the aorta and the disaster that in, then ensued. This is the actual cath from that patient when it, when it was done. So what we see here is dye going in, the valve has been deployed, this valve's up. This contrast out here isn't supposed to be there. That dye is leaving the patient's aorta and going into the patient's chest. And that is a disaster. So the valve is leaking down here into the ventricle, but more importantly, it's leaking out here into the chest. And here's that same valve being deployed and pushing the calcium. This, here's the calcium, see this plate of calcium that goes right out through the aorta. So that's a potential devastating consequence, right? Here is a valve that's already been implanted, right? So that's a bioprosthetic valve that's already been implanted and become diseased. It's stiffened. Uh, we can see the relationship of the leaflets to the aorta. We can see the coronary arteries where they come off. We see the calcium in the aortic wall and the calcium in the coronary arteries. So this is ultra important because if we wanna treat this with a valve and valve, we need to predict what's gonna to happen to that bioprosthetic valve that's already in there. So there's the valve going up. And this is the actual patient. This isn't one of my patients until I operated, until I did surgery on the patient. But this is the, how, what happened to the patient before I operated on the patient. So that bioprosthetic valve that we saw back here, I'm gonna go back to it actually. This bioprosthetic valve, they went through the aorta with a sapien valve and put it inside of this bioprosthetic valve. That's it being expanded. You see it expanding and pushing the leaflets 
of the bioprosthetic valve against the aortic wall. Problem is those leaflets are gonna stay high. And uh, in fact, when they did the procedure, fortunately, they were talented enough and adept enough and fast enough to put stents in both of these coronary arteries as the, um, as the bioprosthetic valve crushed up against the coronary arteries because it was choking off the flow to the heart muscle. The heart would be to have a massive heart attack. They were able to avoid that. But the problem is they've got those stents in there now, the stents are smashed in there, and uh, now you have this. So now you've got a sapient valve inside of there. This is, this is the actual patient before I operated on him. And that sapient valve is not fully expanded, which is not good. We want it to be fully expanded. We wanna even bust the old valve to make it nice and round. And in the process of being expanded to the extent, extent that it was, you can see that the leaflets are pushing up against the coronary ostia. Uh, so they're blocking the blood flow in the coronary ostia, especially the right coronary artery. The blood has a way to kind of make its way in there. There's a little track. So the patient stayed alive, but was short of breath and having chest pain because it wasn't getting enough blood flow to the heart muscle and the valve wasn't working very well. Now, um, this is taken from the actual CT scan that was done before I operated on the patient. And it really nicely shows when we're looking at a scan, a CT scan, a DASI scan of a transcatheter valve that's already been implanted, it looks this kind of thicker uh, kind of uh, network. And so you can see how it flares at the bottom. That's because it's underexpanded. It has a, a little bit of a waste to it. And then you can see it comes up all the way up to these coronary arteries where it's overlapping the coronary arteries to just a little flow path to get in there. So we just took all of that out and uh, we took all of that out and then put a new bioprosthetic valve. In. Now you say, well, why did they do a valve and valve in the first place? Risk can be calculated. It's also in the eye of the beholder. And I would never, ever criticize somebody for trying to take the safest path that they identified for the patient at the time. They were intimidated by the calcium in the aorta. Uh, they didn't feel comfortable doing a second time oper uh, second operation on them. And they did what they thought was the right thing to do. I took, just did a second operation and took everything out, put a new valve in them. And he did fine, which of course is good. So now when we push those leaflets against the aorta into the coronary sinuses, and Adam, you tell me if I'm going too slow, I can always speed it up. You just give me a whatever signal. Um, this is another really fascinating part. So I am really intrigued with this because I've always been really interested in vortical flow, the flow in the coronary sinuses. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, actually, it was, it was literally described by Da Vinci. Da Vinci described the flow pattern in the aortic root and was able to ascertain its role in maintaining the valve and maintaining the flow. So um, it's not, it's, 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 it's pretty often actually that I find things that people think they discovered, they were discovered before. So this is, this is a really brilliant picture because it tells an important story. When we put the transcatheter valve and you see the valve in on the right side, that's a transcatheter valve that's been implanted. And we push those leaflets out of the way. Now we don't have one sinus anymore, we have two. Because when the leaflets get pushed out of the way, there is a little gap, there's gonna be a little gap between the prosthetic valve, the transcatheter valve and the leaflet tissue that's standing up, it's in here. And in that gap then is the place where the blood is that is between the patient's native leaflet and the leaflet of the transcatheter valve. So one of the things we've been trying to figure out is can we predict and how do we manage the presence of clot on the surface of bioprosthetic valves? It's called HALT. It's leaflet, it's thrombus that, it's clot that forms on the surface. It can happen on a surgical, bioprosthetic valve. It's less frequent, but we see why it 
we think we see why it happens with transcatheter valves, at least to some extent. It's because we lose that vortical flow and we have these spaces where the flow, the blood can become static and then you can get clot that forms on the leaflet. So you don't have this open space here anymore, right? We push that leaf at the native leaflet back and we split this space into two spaces. And you see here, when we deploy a transcatheter valve, some of the calcium will limit the expansion. It will change the anatomy of the aortic root. So we change that anatomy, therefore we change the flow. Sorry, there it goes. Uh, and this is a really pretty diagram of that. See, this is, a, this is the root. This is the, uh, or this is a sinus, okay? This is the left coronary sinus uh, with flow into the left coronary artery and you see what's supposed to be happening. See that vortex? Watch it swirl, here it comes. Wait a minute, wait for it. There, see that, see that flow like that? That's what we want. We want those vortices that are responsible for uh, cleaning the leaflets, keeping the space mo in motion, or keeping the blood in motion. So this is a really cool image uh, using fluorescein contrast. Uh, and what they've done here, and this is in Dr. Dossi's lab, they've taken a bioprosthetic valve, made the leaflets clear so that you could see the, the transcatheter valve inside of it, and then looked at the pattern of flow with the fluorescein in the sinus and the neosinus. And on this side, the, the, the contrast gets injected into the neosinus. So wait a second, I think it'll come again. This is the neosinus. This is the actual native sinus over here. This is the neosinus right next to the device. So that's to, to qualitatively at least look at the behavior of the blood and how it changes when we implant that device. We have to think about those things. So again, how do we plan lifelong? Can we, can we enable that through 3D imaging? Can we use uh, the, an understanding of flow physiology combined with uh, aortic root geometry and anatomy uh, and anticipate what the flow dynamics will be and anticipate what we can do in the future? So, what can we do? Can we put, should we do, you know, TAVR? Should we do, should we put a bioprosthetic valve in and plan on a TAVR in there? Should we put a mechanical valve in so they don't have to, the, that might be their last valve because their anatomy calls for it and because their life choices are such. And in the future, which transcatheter valve might need implant in that bioprosthetic valve? Can we predict that? So long-term implications. And that includes coronary access. I should go back one. This is important. When we put a transcatheter valve in, we put any valve in, but especially transcatheter valves in, it changes the way we can access the coronary arteries later. So if somebody needs a stent in their coronary artery, it can be impaired or made more difficult by the transcatheter valve. It's not a nightmare. It's just something we have to think about. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult with the Medtronic valve, although it's getting better because they made the cells, those openings, they made them bigger. Uh, but it's something we have to think about. Uh, so now bicuspid valves. Bicuspid valves, uh, as people, many people know, are kind of near and dear to my heart because um, I do a lot of aortic valve repair for the leaking ones, uh, but they do get stenotic too, right? And so uh, they need to be replaced at times. Um, and this is a valve being put up in a bicuspid valve. Now, the anatomy uh, is such that with bicuspid valves, that if you can imagine, and we'll, I'll show you this a little bit better later, a bicuspid valve doesn't have the normal three commissures, right? It doesn't have three separate leaflets. It has usually two leaflets. One could be much bigger than the other, two fused leaflets. We can get into the details of the anatomy if people want to. And I'm be happy to do another talk on it because it would take another talk. But the important thing is that bicuspid valves are much harder to do transcatheter valves in because they open up differently. They can open up more like an ellipse. So if you can imagine putting something circular in an ellipse, uh, then you could have leaks on either side of that circle. This is a really cool image because this is modeling. This is taking the Sapien 29 implanted, uh, underexpanded a bit, 30 day post operative CT agrees with the computational model. Meaning that if you look here, the, the thick lines, 
That's the actual valve after it's been put in. In other words, that's a CT scan of the valve after it's been put in. The thin lines are the model. They overlap exactly. So that means that the model that was done before that valve went in predicted exactly what it would look like later. So that is confirmation that the technology worked. Taver and taver. Can we put another taver inside of a taver, right? I showed you that lady that had the 20 millimeter sapien. There's no way she gets another taver. There's no room. So, but we can, and we've done it. And you can see here actually, so this is a sapien valve going up, up inside of a core valve. So a Medtronic valve getting a, uh, an Edwards valve put inside of it. Uh, and you can see by deploying just a little bit low here, it keeps those leaflets of the um, Medtronic valve from getting in the way of the coronary arteries. So we can be tactical in the deployment of the second transcatheter valve if they need it. Uh, and in so doing, avoid complications. We all are good at the procedure we can be better at the outcome if we have the information in our fingertips and in our mind walking in. And that's what this is, this is about. Again, validation with a 30 day CT scan this is the same thing. This again, uh, this has all of the images in one, it's kind of confusing, but basically what it tells you is that the preoperative or the pre-TAVR and TAVR prediction was accurate that it worked out fine. Uh, again, we talked about this, right? Can we model the future valve and valve if someone is young-ish or doesn't want to be on, you know, can't be on anticoagulation or whatever, and we know that we're going to have to do another valve, and maybe they're old enough where we think they're not going to need another surgical valve, but we can do a transcatheter valve, or maybe we're going to do two transcatheter valves in them later. That can be modeled ahead of time. This is. Uh, you've probably heard of the Inspiris valve. It's pre-designed so that it will do what I talked about earlier. So you don't have to crack it. It will actually slide open and become larger. It has a linkage built into the frame that allows it to expand. This is modeling for that. So this is the transcatheter valve going up in that Inspiris. And it, the finished product is this nicely expanded valve with plenty of room. It's actually a little bit bigger than the surgical valve was because they expanded past the surgical valve, but still plenty of room to get blood into the coronary arteries and good sinuses, right? So one of the nice things about having a surgical valve in place already is that all the old leaflet tissue has been cut out. Bicuspid morphology, this is a little bit hard for you to understand just from these images, but type zero, type one, type one is the most common. It has a little bit more of an arcing opening. It has two leaflets that are fused together and one that is not. This is a type zero where you have these kind of two even big leaflets, but here's the cool part. So if you have a type zero, for example, which is just going to kind of open as a, almost like a fish mouth uh, with equal size, you can see the, you can see the commissures on both sides, little tents on both sides. You have, you can have mild calcification or you can have more severe calcification and that will change the outcome for us. If we want to do this as a transcatheter valve. Now, Still, most bicuspid valves we will do surgically because we can do a minimally invasive, a little incision. You can have your bicuspid valve taken out and put a surgical valve in and we don't have to worry about the leaks. We don't have a lot of data for transcatheter valves on bicuspid valves. We have very little data for it, but we can be successful with it. And the best way that we're going to be successful with it is to predict what it's going to look like after we put a valve up in it. So let's look at that. Mild calcium big circle, right? And this is with the sapien valve, balloon expandable, big circle. Severe calcium, we don't finish up with such a nice circle. Mild calcium, severe calcium with the Edwards valve. Mild calcium, we get that expanded. We get good tissue approximation. We don't have holes. Severe calcium, not so nice. It's not round. If that valve isn't round when we finish, it will not last as long. It is more likely to get clawed on it. It is less likely to perform the way it's supposed to perform. So what do we get? We get these. We, this is a configuration we want. 
round, no leaks around it. This is a configuration we do not want. Irregular, leaflets are gonna open up incorrectly and there's space around that for the blood to leak through down into the ventricle. Unhappy. Questions and answers. I've got to tell you, I um, I heard about uh, Dossi a, a bit ago, but this is um, really some next level stuff. Uh, I've never seen anything as a as a patient where I could conceptualize and see things like the calcification of the valve, the impact of expanding the leaflets inside the. I mean, this is really beyond cutting edge, and I'm curious to know: is this something that most doctors are using, most surgeons, interventional cardiologists are looking at, or is this, are, you, are we in the infancy here of the utility of this technology? Because it seems like you got upside for durability, modeling, uh, long-term performance, lifelong plan of, of valve therapy. I, I mean, I, I'm really just beyond excited for what this means to the industry. Right, so uh, it is a little bit in its infancy in two ways. Um, one is what I talked about earlier, which I think that it's kind of a sky's the limit kind of process, uh, especially with the kind of intellectual horsepower that they have working on it. The other is that, um, as you can imagine, um, people, physicians who do things very well, sometimes have trouble appreciating how they might do it better. It's not, to, it's not anything, it's not to say people are arrogant or anything. It's just that, boy, I tell you, the surgeons and, and cardiologists that do this stuff are so good and they're so successful. It's hard for them sometimes to think beyond the methodology that they have. And people don't like to change when they're successful, right? But can you be a little more successful, right? Can you predict things better and can you fashion and model things for the future better for the patient? So what's happened lately though, um, is that, uh, cause I've been watching it happen. Um, when they have been around other physicians that kind of have the fire in their belly about this stuff, they're getting very excited. So I think we're going to see a little bit of a wave front now, um, that will, uh, that is kind of gripping the, the field. So my expectation is that people will take more and more advantage of it, but right now it, it relative to the overall experience, it's a small number. Got it. And so yeah. I, I, I could go on and on uh, about your use of this. You're using this today with your patients. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, right. So we're at this point, we're doing it on some patients. Um, I'm not sure, you know, as, as people always tell you, I do a lot of things for my patients and I don't know how to draw the line. In other words, how do you know how do you know when somebody's not going to benefit from something? How certain can you be? So um, I think that you know we, we're becoming consider, we're becoming more liberal with it, and in the sense that we want to make sure that we're optimizing for every patient. So as the techno technology advances, becomes a uh, more rapid turnaround. I think that's going to happen in a lot of places. But uh, yes, we do use it in our patients. We've been using it more and more. Uh, anytime we see any potential fallibility or any question, then we just do it. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm so uh, thrilled to hear all the great things that you're working on. And let's get to some of the patient questions. And Dr. Gerdish, I'm going to ask you to rapid fire these because we have got a lot that have come in. So we're going to get to as many as we can for all the people that are on the line. So Let's start with Susan's question that came in. She asks, how long does a TAVR procedure take? How long are patients in the hospital? How do I know if I'm a candidate? Perfect questions. So um, let's start by how long does it take? Uh, it's pretty fast. Uh, you know, it's an hour um, of real, you know, doing it time. Uh, it takes some time to get you in the room and gets everything set up, get you out of the room, but it's pretty fast. People don't have to go on the ventilator 95% of the time. We just sedate them. Um, and uh, hospital time is going down. So most people go home the next day. Uh, the, some folks are going home the same day in some places now. And we're probably going to start working away toward that a little bit. There's still, again, you're not coming in for a haircut. So there's still things that can happen and they can happen within that first day. So 
we're progressing toward that a little bit. But I think the fact is that the vast majority of people go home the next day. Certainly if you don't need a pacemaker, right? So the pacemakers are kind of the, still the Achilles heel. Uh, I have to say that with DASI uh, and our ability to, to implant higher, more safely, um, that I think is starting to take a fade as well um, for everybody. You know, everybody will say, well, we don't really have a, we don't put many pacemakers in. Nah, everybody says that. But the, if the national data is that overall transcatheter valves are still associated with about a 10% rate of pacemakers. So that's something we're trying to make go away nationally. Uh, how do you know if you're a candidate? Uh, great question. I guess in a sense, you know, everybody's a candidate. You can have the conversation. Uh, the better question is what makes the most sense for you? So um, what's the long game? What's your anatomy look like? In other words, if I have a transcatheter valve, which valve am I going to get? How big is it going to be? Am I going to be able to get another valve inside of that one later? Uh, am I, and if I'm, if that's her on the, in the picture there, she might need three. <laughs> People live a long time now. And uh, so that's the real conversation. Everybody's a candidate for everything. Uh, but you might think, yeah, well, you know, it might make more sense to get a minimally invasive surgical valve. If you can get a nice size surgical valve, then you've got a nice platform for transcatheter valve later if you need it. Uh, and also you get all that leaflet tissue out of there. So you have normal sinus anatomy. Um, and then, uh, you know, minimally invasive aortic valve. Well, I, I've sent people home day two now often. We get a guy in the hospital right now going home day two. So um, that, you know, you're not stuck in a hospital for a long time. You're up and around right away, a few days in the hospital. So those are the things to think about anyway. Well, I've never heard of a day to go home on any form this is, of open heart, Mark. Uh, it's just, yeah, you know, it just started for us. It's, and I think it has to do, honestly, with uh, we're using a new drainage system and, and people are just kind of up and ready to go faster. It's, we can get into the details of that sometime, but this is a new thing for us too, actually. Wow. All right. Let's keep it going. And yes, yeah, Susan is, that is her. Uh, so here's a great question. I know you do a lot of research on materials. You and yeah. I have talked about extracellular yeah. matrix. Martin asks, is there any update on the polymer valves or yeah. other materials that can provide a lifelong fix for patients without Coumadin? Yeah. So it's such exciting stuff. Uh, did you put that picture in Adam of the Foldex? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so every once in a while, I go back and read about the Foldex to see where they are. Uh, you know, they are, that's an interesting device. They have stuck with it. They've been able to keep the valve coming. Um, nobody's had the breakthrough yet. Uh, it's, it's probably not too far off. I, there are two different approaches. One is this, which is the concept of a polymer that is so benign, let's say, that it's indistinguishable and the body doesn't recognize it, it doesn't attack it, and you don't get calcification or changes in it. Uh, the other is what we've been working on, as I think you know, for well over a decade, which is a matrix valve, which is actually tissue uh, that we process so that, and it's, it's uh, pig tissue, that we process and take all of the antigen out of it, all of the antigenicity out of it, and then we build a valve out of it, and then the person's own stem cells populate that tissue, populate that framework, and we they grow a valve. We're not perfect on that either, but we are in an FDA study with it. So we've been at it for a decade, and we've got that valve going in as part of an FDA study, only in the tricuspid position. So I would say that we're inching toward this. I wouldn't expect a revolutionary change in the next few years or several years, but I think you know. I think within our lifetime, you know, my lifetime, um, we're going to get to that. Um, there, the, if we look at the two sides of it, the one side is kind of engineering this, and the other side is, can we change the way we manage our current valves? Are there things that we can do to them or for the patient that will allow them to last longer? So that's a little bit, that's lower hanging fruit. And we talked about some of that at the beginning. Next. And on behalf of the patients, thanks for the research that you're doing, Dr. Gerdish. I'm going to go to a question that I think is really important and really personal to you, <laughs> which is, let's pretend, Dr. Gerdish, you were diagnosed 
with moderate to severe aortic stenosis, you know a lot. What would you do if you had to go about the process of selecting a valve and think about the lifelong plan given your age? Yeah. So we have longevity in my family. Uh, my grandmother on my dad's side died when she was 106. My other grandma died when she's 100. I prefer to select them as opposed to the men who died younger. And um, I'm pretty healthy. Um, I do think I'll probably live well into my 90s, especially kind of the way life is now. And I pay attention to things. So I'm looking at like, right, if I had that right now, moderate to severe, first thing I would do is tighten up my window of evaluation. I'd be looking for any signal. Is my left atrium getting bigger? Do I have pulmonary hypertension? Have I gotten any tricuspid insufficiency? Is the circumferential or longitudinal strain in my left ventricle changing? Is it getting thick? There are some amazing patients that I see that have these really bad looking aortic valves. They have these tissue valves that have just, they have been kicking it for a long time and their ventricles are normal. Their hearts are normal. And there are other people I'll see with the same process and their hearts are really rough looking and they're in trouble. So the, the important thing is to look, right? So if I, if I had moderate to severe right now, I'd be doing echoes eh, every six months <laughs> and just looking for subtle changes. Then you ask me, what valve would I choose? Um, to be honest, I would probably take an onyx valve and hope that the that the Eloquist trial pans out. We're not finished with it yet. I really would prefer just to have one procedure and take my medicine. I'm okay taking medicine. I don't mind taking medicine. It's fine with me. I don't mind being on a blood thinner. You know, other people, they can't because they, you know, whatever, they ride motorcycles or something. Or I might consider a Ross procedure. I mean, I'm a little old for it, but I am pretty healthy. Uh, you have the, you know, there are issues related to that operation that I could dive into, but the reality of it is that survival has been really superb in very healthy people. So, uh, those are probably what I would look at. I don't think I'd take a tissue valve right now because I do think I'm going to live to be well into my nineties. Um, if we look at the data, the data tells us that if you're over 65, that a tissue valve is a smart move. Uh, but remember that that is looking at everybody. So you fit into a continuum somewhere. Just be honest with yourself and what you want and what your uh, outlook is. Yeah, I love your response. And for uh, new patients who are newly diagnosed, just want to let you know the onyx valve that he's referring to is a mechanical valve. And just so you know, Dr. Gerdish, I'm now on year 16 with my Ross procedure. Right, right. And so uh, I can say <laughs> I'm a little biased when it comes yeah. to that. But we are all <laughs> unique. And let's talk about a really big question. And yeah. this is something we get all the time here, which is Dana puts it perfectly. Will there be no more open heart surgery in the next 10 years? Dana, I love this question because I've been getting asked this question for 30 years. So when I finished training, people said to me, well, what are you going to do? Heart surgery is going to be gone. <laughs> and, and I just keep getting busier. So obviously heart surgery is not going away. What does that mean? It means a couple of things. First of all, heart surgery has adapted in a couple of very important ways, very important ways for human beings, for, for us to live well and to be well. One is we have mastered minimally invasive surgery. And that changed the experience for, for the patient so dramatically uh, that it became kind of a neck and neck between anything else that could possibly come up. Uh, so small incision, rapid recovery, and rapid recovery in general. So even for, as you know, Adam, folks here, I'm sending a guy home day two who had a sternotomy, had a tumor resection and a sternotomy. He's going home day two. Why? Because of the way we close the chest and the way we manage their drainage. So evolution in the technology, evolution in the procedures, surgeons being focused on the skill set and, uh, and specialization. Uh, there are fabulous coronary surgeons. There are fabulous valve repair surgeons. There might not, they might not be the same person. The other is that surgeons have 
been able to nurture their skill set with respect to doing complex reoperations. Today, I did a third day, third time redo, air to grudy, sending over to Hemi Arch, you know, massive operation. Uh, and sometimes we have to do those because people get infections. Sometimes we have to do those because their valve wore out. Sometimes we have to do them because they developed an aneurysm they didn't have before. So reoperations will remain the purview of heart surgery forever. And that includes transcatheter valves that fail or get infected or whatever the next technology is. You know, we published a paper on, on uh, failed mitra clips and doing minimally invasive surgery for those. So I think mitra clips are fantastic. I think they have a real role, but uh, people recognize there was a, a, guy, a surgeon I trained with by the name of Henry Sullivan. Uh, and he looked at me once and he said, Gerdish, we're the caboose on the train. What he meant by that was you go, you can run through all the cars. Eventually you got to get to the caboose. So heart surgery is going to be around for a long time, Dana. I, I hope that, I hope that uh, we're always around to help people out. Thank you for the question though. Yeah. And Dr. Gerdish, uh, on that note, we're going to come to the end of this webinar, but for the folks on the line, please don't hang up just yet. I personally want to extend a humongous thank you to all the members of the community. We got questions coming in left and right still because of your interest in being educated and empowered, we get to do these really great events together. So thanks so much for being a part of our community. The other person I got to thank right now is Dr. Gerdish. As always, you bring a unique perspective to heart surgery that helps us learn how to take the best care of our heart valves and our hearts. So Dr. Gerdish, thank you so much for sharing all these incredible insights today. And as we wrap up, I'd like to thank everybody. I'm gonna put up a quick survey on the screen. If you could please complete it, that will help us improve all of our future webinar events. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gerdish. And thanks for doing the survey. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining, everybody. Hi everybody, it's Adam. I hope you enjoyed that video. And don't forget, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. Watch the next two educational videos coming up on your screen or click the blue button to visit parkvalvesurgery.com.